Now, what's listed next is the electrical conducting system of the heart. And uh, uh, there's, I'm going to describe a special, what is the electrical conducting system of the heart? I'm sure you learned about anatomy. It consists of specialized myocardial tissue. These are not nerve cells, but specialized heart muscle cells that act to generate and conduct the action potential rapidly through the heart. Uh, and we mentioned the sinoatrial node or SA node, the atrioventricular AV node, uh, the common bundle of his, the uh, right left bundle branches, the Purkinje fibers, and so on. Uh, you have a picture of this uh, back on uh, page, page we were just on page 186. And 186 has a picture of this electrical conducting system of the heart. Now, do you think, incidentally, you have pictures of any of this stuff in your book? No, probably they don't. The, the, someday the books will include this stuff. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I knew you were like kidding. I was crazy. Yes. Yeah. 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 I knew. Okay, so it's all in the book, and they've got great pictures. Now, uh, this picture, obviously, in our lecture outline, like all the other pictures, everything's black and white. Hmm. And it really looks better in color. So while you've got pictures in your book, I've provided it for you in color. If you go to uh, my website, so uh, this is the section dealing with heart and circulation. If you scroll down, it says heart anatomy and the EKG, the electrocardiogram, Frank Netter, color image, JPG. All right, this was a picture that was made by a very famous medical illustrator named Frank Netter. Frank Netter actually attended Harvard Medical School. He never practiced medicine. He was a very talented artist, and he was very famous. He passed away a few years ago, but he uh, did these beautiful medical illustrations showing anatomy, physiology, pathology, and so on. So if you click right on this, there's the same picture in color. And of course, uh, if you have a computer, know how to use it, you can enlarge it as big as you want. Right. So we can see uh, this uh, image. All right. Now again, you've got pictures, of course, in your book. But uh, we'll just show you this. All right, so uh, this is the same picture you've got on 186, but in color. Last class meeting, uh, we talked about the electrical conducting system of the heart. We said that it's made up of specialized heart muscle cells. They are not nerve cells. They are specialized heart muscle cells. Uh, there is a collection of them uh, up here, right where the superior vena cava connects to the right atrium. And that collection of cells, known as the sinoatrial node or SA node, those cells spontaneously depolarize and fire off action potentials at a faster rate than any other cells in your heart. Since the heart cells are electrically joined to one another by what we call intercalated discs or gap junctions, then once these cells fire, that was good, fire off an action potential, it just spreads throughout the rest of the heart. Now, if they didn't fire off, then we have learned that the next fastest rate of cells that fire off action potentials are right here at the AV node, or atrioventricular node. So uh, if the SA node were to stop working because of either myocardial ischemia or simply absolute infarction or death, then the AV node, we learned, takes over as the pacemaker. And if you're wondering what page did I tell you that, it was explicitly stated on the bottom of 189. Absolutely, with an asterisk or star. So <clears throat> the uh, action potential normally goes from the SA node across the atria, through the AV node, through the common bundle or bundle of His, and then it's conducted rapidly down the right bundle branch and left bundle branch, which are located right within the interventricular septum. What's the word septum mean? Wall. wall. The wall between the ventricles. And the action potential spreads through what the, these very fine, special heart muscle cells called Purkinje fibers, named after Dr. Purkinje. And then the action potential spreads through uh, the actual heart muscle cells of the ventricle, the ventricular myocardial cells. So that's the order, and that order that I've just given you is the exact order that these are written in. And it just shows you 
You can see how the action potential, this starts out sooner than this one, then 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 this one. Then this one. You also notice the appearance of the uh, action potential. M uh, most heart muscle cells, especially of the ventricles, that actually contract have this really long, prolonged action potential. Last time we talked about the depolarizing phase, the plateau phase, and the repolarizing phase. We said that what creates this long plateau phase is the influx of calcium ions moving into the heart muscle cells through voltage-gated calcium ion channels, and that calcium is needed in order for the heart muscle cells to contract. We pointed out that there's a class of drugs called calcium ion channel blockers that reduce that influx or flowing in of calcium ions into those cells, and that has the effect, among other things, of slowing the heart rate down. Uh, but uh, anyhow, that's the calcium ion channel blockers. Um, we see in contrast that uh, the uh, pacemaker cells in the SA node uh, depolarize and repolarize. They don't really have this long plateau phase. That's why those, those uh, are indeed the pacemaker cells of the heart. Uh, and incidentally, they don't really contract, so therefore there's no need for calcium to flow into the pacemaker cells. <clears throat> now, uh, we try to begin talking, uh, start talking about the electrocardiogram. And the most common electrocardiogram that's run is known as a lead to electrocardiogram. I defined it last time. I will remind you of what I said in just a few minutes. It basically consists of three waves that can be uh, monitored by placing electrodes on the surface of the body. This is not the same as this. The way you monitor or measure an action potential is you actually have to stick a, a microelectrode into a heart cell to see this actual change in voltage. That's with a microelectrode inserted into an individual cell. These waves are simply created by millions of cells undergoing depolarization or repolarization at about the same time. To use a fancy term, if, you're, if you can get this, if you don't, don't worry about it, there's a dipole, a change in the dipole movement, uh, because where the polarity of the cells goes from being minus on the, positive on the outside to negative on the outside. It reverses electrical polarity. Uh, it, the whole cell is reversing electrical polarity, including the fluid on the outside. And this change in electrical polarity, or dipole action, uh, creates this, uh, uh, this uh, uh, field effect, this electromagnetic field effect. And that's really what you're picking up. So uh, there are three basic waves, uh, what I, Willem Eindhoven called a P wave, a flat period, a QRS wave, and a T wave. Now these waves correspond to how that action potential uh, is moving through uh, the heart. And uh, it's, the nice thing about this picture is it's color-coded, so you can see this. Uh, the main point here is that the P wave is created by the depolarization occurring in atrial muscle cells, where all these atrial muscle cells are depolarizing at approximately the same time. If you simply see where this depolarization is and you draw a line straight down, that corresponds. That's why this is shown in green. So we learned that if the P wave doesn't look normal, that informs the cardiologist, the doctors, that the atria are not depolarizing normally. All right, so that starts to zero in on where the electrical problem is in their heart. Now, uh, as the action potential moves through the, uh, from the atria through the AV node in the common bundle, those are very few cells that, where this action potential is traveling through. So these electrodes on the surface of the body can't even pick up that uh, uh, electrical current flow. So it just goes flat right here. And that's why it looks yellow and orange. That just corresponds with the action potential moving through these small number of cells so it, it doesn't even pick it up uh, on the uh, surface of the body, so it looks like nothing is happening. However, cardiologists will, if this flat period doesn't look normal, if it's not flat, or if it goes for too long of a time, or too short of a time, they say that there's a problem somewhere in this AV node common bundle area. 
And we will see very shortly that if, for example, this flat period goes for a longer period of time than normal, it just means that there's some sort of problem in the electrical current flowing through that AV node common bundle area. What would the problem be? Most commonly, myocardial ischemia, where the heart muscle isn't getting enough oxygen. Last class meeting, we tried to emphasize that the most common organ or tissue of the body to have this problem of ischemia is heart muscle for the, a couple of reasons that I gave, presented to you last time. <clears throat> now, uh, the QRS wave is created as the ventricular muscle cells all start to depolarize at more or less the same time. So therefore, if the QRS wave doesn't look normal, if there's anything abnormal in its uh, shape, in how tall it is, in how wide it is, then that is interpreted uh, as a problem in the ventricle muscles depolarizing. We also pointed out that the reason why the QRS wave is larger than the P wave is because there's more ventricular muscle cells than there are atrial muscle cells, and that creates a larger current effect. Uh, there's also, uh, we know that it takes about 300 milliseconds or three tenths of a second for a ventricular heart muscle cell between the time it depolarizes and repolarizes. And indeed, about 300 milliseconds after the QRS wave is this third wave called a T wave. This is created by a repolarization of all these ventricular heart muscle cells at approximately the same time. As they all start to repolarize, again, it creates a dipole effect, a change in electrical polarity in all these cells that can be picked up on the surface of the body. So that's the T wave. If the T wave doesn't look normal, then that is interpreted as the ventricles not repolarizing normally. Now, one of the other things we pointed out last time, and I'll just remind you, so we have a wave created when the ventricles depolarize. We have a wave when the ventricles repolarize. Shouldn't we similarly, therefore, have a wave not only when the atria depolarize, but also when the atria repolarize. Well, look at it. The atrial muscle cells repolarize at exactly the same time that the ventricle muscles depolarize. So hidden, hidden, concealed right in here would be another wave created by the atrial muscles all repolarizing, changing their electrical polarity at about the same time. So it's just hidden or concealed but there would be a wave. There's a wave created that you can pick up on the surface of the body as all these cells are changing electrical polarity at about the approximately the same time. All right, now, uh, every, you'll, you're going to see that everything I've described is actually written in the lecture outline. Let's, let's be explicit and show you exactly where. Uh, take a look, we'll jump ahead for a moment. Look on page 196. And on 196, oh, professor, sorry, yeah. and the flat part in the, between S and T, what is that? I'm going to get into all that. Yeah. This is page 196. And uh, on 196, this is where I'm talking about, and on the pages just before it, I define uh, PR interval, QRS complex, T wave, and I'm going to walk you through all that. But this particular picture is really nice. It basically shows you, this is the electrocardiogram right here. Here's the P wave, the flat period, the QRS wave, the T wave, and it literally shows you where that action potential is in time that's creating this electrocardiogram pattern. So in other words, what does it show the P wave? Well, how is it labeled? Atrial depolarization. And uh, this flat period, is created as the action potential is moving first through the AV node, then the common bundle of Hiss, and the bundle branches. And the QRS is created by depolarization of the ventricles. Here you can see on this picture of the heart, numbered, in order, how that electrical current is flowing through the heart. So this just creates this wave pattern that is picked up on the surface of the body. Anyhow, take a look at that. I, I'm not done yet, so we're going to have more to say about it. Let's uh, backtrack, though, to uh, back to page 192. So on page 192, we covered this last time. We said that uh, the electrodes, 
are uh, the original three sets of, uh, of uh, uh, we'll call them leads, that were originally developed by Willem Eindhoven were created by placing the electrodes on the wrists and ankles. Uh, they, nowadays, as we pointed out last time, they also place additional electrodes on the chest. Altogether, they can record 12 different views of how that electrical current is moving three-dimensionally through your heart. Uh, we mentioned, we said last time, think of these different uh, 12 different leads similar to 12 different x-ray views of your chest from the front, from the sides, from the back. These are different views of how that electrical current is moving three-dimensionally through the heart. Just like we said, they, if they were only going to do one x-ray of your chest, the view that usually gives them the most information is just a straight uh, anterior AP view of the chest. And the view uh, that gives them the most information about the electrical current moving through the heart is what's called lead to. Anyhow, these, uh, these electrodes, uh, which are simply all they are, they used to be metal contacts. Now they use an electrolytic gel, anything that conducts electrical current. Uh, they connect a cable to it, and it goes into a machine. Uh, you can see the machines at the back of the room. Right? And all that the machine is is an amplifier that amplifies the signal and a, a chart recorder that as these vo uh, uh, voltage changes uh, occur, they cause the pen to move uh, and it draws out these wave patterns, which are simply indicating changes in voltage over time. That's really what it's showing. Uh, we said that ideally the person should be lying down and relaxed. They need to relax their skeletal muscles because if you're tense and you contract your skeletal muscles, your arm and leg muscles, then these electrocardiogram, these electrodes start to pick up electrical currents coming from your skeletal muscle rather than your heart muscle. Keep in mind, you've got even more skeletal muscle cells in your body than heart muscle cells. So if you start causing action potentials in your skeletal muscle cells, that creates a much bigger electrical current than the current created by your heart muscle cells. So it will totally obscure and uh, prevent you from seeing the electrical current changes in your heart cells. Uh, the uh, Willem Eindhoven identified, uh, uh, he set up this system originally with three so-called bipolar limb leads. This is where, as I said, you place the electrodes on the limbs, wrists and ankles, and uh, uh, you measure the difference in voltage between two points on the body. So they're called bipolar limb leads. Uh, they, these are the three. You should know these three. Uh, but the most important is lead two. Lead one measures the difference in electrical voltage between RA and LA. All right? So uh, I don't know. That's uh, the rest of Los Angeles and Los Angeles. No, I didn't get but uh, so it's between the right arm and the left arm. Uh, lead three measures the difference in voltage between the left arm and left leg. The most important of the three, and the only one that I'm really going to try to explain a little bit about how to interpret, is lead two, which measures the difference in voltage between the right arm and left leg. <clears throat> so these are different views of how the electrical current is moving through the heart three-dimensionally. I mentioned last class meeting, and I'm going to explain these leads in more detail in just a moment, but I mentioned last time on page 193 that uh, they have, uh, in addition to those three leads, si uh, nine more leads, nine more leads, altogether a total of 12. I'm not asking you to know them at all, but if you really wanted to get into this uh, field, you would learn them all. Okay, so we're just we're asking you to know the definitions of three of them and to know one of them, lead two, in a little bit more detail. Now, why is lead two the most important? Uh, here's a picture of the heart. The SA node is located in the upper right side of the heart, right where the superior vena cava connects to the right atrium. The uh, electrical current basically is traveling from the upper right side of the heart to the apex, the pointy tip. And the pointy tip, or apex of the heart, 
right, is towards the lower left side of the heart. So generally, this major, the major flow of electrical current through the heart is moving from the upper right side of the heart to the lower left. The best view that allows us to see whether or not this current is flowing from the upper right to the lower left is this view right here. This is where you've got an electrode that's on the upper right side of your body and an electrode on the lower left. And we want to see if this electrical current that it's picking up is moving in that downward direction. If the, when, if the current moves in this direction from the upper right to the lower left, then since we're monitoring the electrical voltage changes between here and here, this is, will create an upward wave whenever that electrical current is moving in this direction from up, uh, upper right to lower left. How do you know it's an upper wave? That's what this plus sign is. All right, that creates an upward wave. What would it look like if the electrical current was flowing in the exact reverse direction from lower left to upper right? It would create a downward wave as represented by that minus sign. Now, each of these other leads, not only the lead one and lead three, but those nine other leads are defined differently. So in other words, if you're monitoring lead one on an electrocardiogram, you only see an upward wave if the current is moving from the right arm to the left arm. That's the only time you'll see an upward wave. If the current moves in this direction, in the reverse direction, from a left uh, uh, arm to right arm, it creates a downward wave. So in each case, the plus sign, the arrow and the plus sign, tells you which direction uh, it, it, uh, the, uh, current, uh, if the current is moving, will create an upward wave when you're monitoring the electrocardiogram with lead one, lead two, lead three, or any of the others. Lead, uh, so that, that each one is defined differently. They are giving us different views of how that electrical current is traveling three-dimensionally through the heart. Uh, okay, so we've, we've talked about the definition of lead two. Um, okay. Uh, let's take a look at page, my page is mixed up here, uh, 194, and on 194, where we left off last time, so far I haven't, 45 minutes into the class, I'm starting to now talk about something new. Um, so what you're looking at here is commonly known, first of all, it's lead to, it says it right here. As I mentioned last time, if you have an electrocardiogram, if you don't know what lead it is, you can throw it away. It's worthless because you don't know how to interpret it. You have to know which lead it is. And usually, as the machine records it, it prints the lead. But if it didn't, you have to write it down, what lead. Because a lead, an electrocardiogram, without knowing which lead it is, which view, you simply are unable to interpret it at all. All right, so this has lead to, and that's the one I'm going to be talking about. Uh, this, what, is, uh, what these recordings are, are literally graphs of voltage changes over time. So uh, the, uh, horizontally, these, uh, it's, if it's recorded on graph paper, each little box represents a certain amount of time. Technically, each little box is 0.04 seconds in time. You'll see that in a moment. Uh, vertically, each little box is a certain number or fraction of millivolts of voltage, certain, or certain voltage. And uh, these waves have to last the right amount of time, and they have to be the right height, the right amount of voltage. If their voltage doesn't fall within the normal range, if the time that they last falls either too short or too long outside the normal range, it's just like everything else we've learned about in this class. If your blood sugar level is lower than it should be or higher than it should be, if your thyroxin level is lower or higher than it should be, then there's a pathology. There's something wrong because it should fall within what's considered the normal range. Uh, now, uh, the, uh, this particular electrocardiogram we're looking at is totally normal. A totally normal pattern is called an NSR. It's short, uh, abbreviation for a normal sinus rhythm. Why they call it sinus is because the pacemaker, the normal pacemaker of the heart, is the sinoatrial node, or SA node. So that's called a normal sinus rhythm. 
you'll notice that you can see, as you look at this, uh, the three basic waves. So uh, looking at them and zoom in. So uh, usually the easiest wave to recognize immediately is the tall QRS wave. So this is really the Q, the R, and the S. And then when, once we kind of spot a QRS, the way, we, the way that you actually analyze this, the first wave after a QRS is called the T wave, and the next wave after the T wave is actually the P wave of the next uh, uh, unit. Now, each series of P, Q, R, S, and T represents a cardiac cycle, a cardiac cycle or heartbeat. So P, Q, R, S, T, that's associated with one heartbeat. P, Q, R, S, T, the next heartbeat. So uh, that's what you're seeing. Uh, let's look at an enlarged view. This is obviously much enlarged compared to the way it would really look on the real paper that you would see. Uh, and so uh, here it shows this P wave, the Q, R, S wave, and the T wave. Uh, this, when it's recorded on paper, it is a standardized grid paper. Uh, each little box is a millimeter by a millimeter, and each little millimeter is 0.04 seconds in time, horizontally, 0.04 seconds in time. So you'll notice looking at this P wave, it looks like it lasts approximately 0.08 seconds. Each little box is 0.04 seconds, two little boxes is 0.08. Uh, so uh, I'm not asking you, I'm not asking you to memorize how long each of these little waves should last or how tall they should be in millivolts. I'm only going to ask you to memorize one of all these things, but uh, just one. But here on the right, it indicates the normal range, how long a P wave should last between 0.08 and 0.10 seconds. If it lasts either less than that or more than that, then it's not right. There's something wrong with the P wave, which as you know, Bless you, we know the P wave corresponds with atrial depolarization. So the atria are not depolarizing uh, in the normal way. Uh, so they, they talk about QRS complex, T wave, ST segment, QT segment, and all these other things. Let's remind ourselves of what these waves are. The P wave, we've said, co corresponds to atrial depolarization. If the, let's just as an example, if the P wave was larger than normal, bigger, taller, faster, stronger, no, if it was, it was, if it was taller and wider, just bigger than normal, why would, obviously that means that there, the, there's more electrical current than normal than the P wave. Why would that happen? That, well, one of the things that would most likely cause that is an enlargement of the atrial muscle. Because if the atrial muscle is, has become hypertrophied or enlarged, that would create a bigger P wave, a bigger uh, electrical current in the atrial muscle, which is associated with the P wave. There are many things that can cause atrial hypertrophy or enlargement. I'm not going to ask you this, but mitral stenosis will cause the atria to have to work harder, and that causes an enlarged atrial muscle, and therefore, and you can see that non-invasively by observing an enlarged P wave. That's how you interpret it. Uh, let's look on the, the uh, 195, I'm sorry, 196. And on 196, uh, the PR interval, uh, what's that? The, uh, uh, let's, uh, Sorry to have you flip back and forth, but let's go back to the previous page, 194. On 194, and incidentally, you'll notice that I indicated this is lead to, everything I'm teaching you is lead to. So you, uh, I'm not teaching you anything really about lead, any of the other leads, so don't start to interpret them because you don't know anything about them, all right, other than they're different from lead to. All right, uh, you'll notice that right here it says PR interval. And the PR interval is measured from the beginning of the P to the Q. Now this always bothers everybody, because obviously if it's measured from the beginning of the P to the Q, then it should be called the PQ interval. But the electrocardiogram should be called an ECG, and they call it an EKG. So I, I, I don't know what to tell you. They measure the PR interval from the beginning of the P to the Q. 
uh, and they call it the PR interval. Now, what, uh, I'm sorry. I know, I'm sorry. All right, uh, but I didn't, I didn't, I'm not responsible. All right, now, um, what is the PR interval really telling us? Uh, actually, again, let's look on page 196. Yeah. And I'm, yeah, I haven't told you what you have to know yet, so hold on. All right? Now, on, on this picture on uh, 196, okay, so on 196, think about it. If you're measuring how long it takes between the beginning of the P until the Q, you're really measuring how long it's taking for the action potential to go from the SA node to the ventricle. Does that make sense? The beginning of the P is where the, where the SA node fires off the impulse. And the QRS is the uh, depolarization of the ventricles. So if you're measuring how long of a time it takes between here to here, that's really measuring how long it took for the action potential to go from here to the ventricles. Can everybody follow that? This is where it reaches the ventricles. This is where it began. So how long did it take to get from here to here? <clears throat> so why this is used is because usually if it's taking longer than it should, the big problem, the bottleneck, was right here. So it is used to diagnose AV nodal block problems because if it's the PR interval takes longer than it should. Right above, we wrote that the PR interval is the period between the beginning of the P and the onset of the Q, even though it's called PR interval. Here's the number I want you to know. A PR interval longer than 2 tenths of a second indicates some problem with the AV node, because it's just taking too long to get from the SA node to the ventricles and the big bottleneck most commonly is in the, through the, as the impulse travels through the AV node. Now, let me try to sh uh, convey in an exaggerated way, not a realistic way, but an exaggerated way, what's really going on. Uh, at, I wrote the following at the bottom of the page. All right, and again, this is a, uh, I'm, I'm exaggerating it to make the point. If this is a normal electrocardiogram, a P wave, flat, QRS, T wave, <laughs> all right? And the PR interval is the time from the beginning of the P to the Q. And it should normally be less than 2 tenths of a second. Now, I drew a second electrocardiogram. You will never see anything this extreme. They are much more subtle than this. But using this extreme example, look at this. Here's the P wave. What's the P wave represent? Atrial depolarization. Look how long I made this flat period. What is, what is occurring in, during that flat period? The action potential is traveling through the AV node. So can everybody see that I've, in this very exaggerated example, it's taken way too long to go through that AV node before we finally get a QRS, meaning it finally made it through the AV node and made it to the ventricles. Clearly, measuring this PR interval is, much, is way longer than normal. And the big problem was it was just taking too long for the impulse to get through that AV node. So that's, that's why measuring the PR interval is used diagnostically at, that if it's greater than 2 tenths of a second, it's basically pointing its finger to a problem in the AV node. And by a problem, we mean myocardial ischemia in the AV node. So that's sick. Huh? We'll play a little music while we OK, so that's the uh, PR interval. And we did mention uh, right up here that uh, an AV nodal block problems are the most common reason why somebody would require a pacemaker. Because if the signals are taken way too long to get from the SA node down into the ventricles, they're going to put a battery-powered pacemaker, and they're going to electrically shock that ventricle at a faster rate. 
They, uh, again, if we had more time, we would go into this stuff in more detail. They actually categorized the severity of the AV nodal block problem. They talk about first degree AV nodal block, second degree AV nodal block, and third degree, also known as complete AV nodal block. And you see changes in this abnormality of the electrocardiogram depending upon the severity. But we don't have time to get into that. Heart murmur has a valve problem. This, has not an, this is an electrical problem. There's lots of problems. You say, tell me about it. I got a lot of problems. Yes? Can someone with a pacemaker, uh, can the sympathetic and parasympathetic? Yes, yes, system? it can. Because the autonomic nervous system is still working. The problem here is the electrical conducting system of the heart. So there's just all these different variations. I mean, I think we're starting to see how damn complicated the body is. Uh, okay, now uh, the T wave. The T wave corresponds to ventricular repolarization, as we've learned. Now, just as a few examples that I'd like you to know, a flat T wave, meaning the T wave is flat rather than being an upward wave, is commonly we will see that with ventricular myocardial ischemia. So the, uh, basically, a flat T wave, we know that the ventricles are not repolarizing normally. You'd say, what should a normal T wave look like? Like this. If it's flat, it doesn't look like that. Uh, another example, an inverted T wave. An inverted T wave. You'd say, what does inverted mean? The opposite of normal. So if a normal wave goes up, what if you saw the T wave and it was inverted going down? We commonly see that with a ventricular myocardial infarction. So when there is literally dead heart muscle in the ventricles, they don't repolarize normally at all, and literally we see an inverted T wave. A peaked T wave, where it kind of goes to a pointy tip, is typically what we see with hyperkalemia, elevated potassium, electro, uh, potassium levels. And uh, we know how important potassium, especially sodium, lesser, less so, these electrolytes are the whole basis of the electrical activity of the body, including the heart muscle cells. <clears throat> now, uh, we're going to show you an example of all this in um, just a moment. But before we do, uh, I, have, I have described here how the electrical current is generally moving in, from the upper right side to the lower left. Now, let's see if I can explain this. Remember how lead 2 is defined? Lead 2 says we get an upward wave whenever the electrical current is moving in kind of a, from an upper right to a lower left direction. So can you see with this arrow that as the action potential spreads across the atria in this kind of downward direction, that's why we get an upward P wave. And then as the action potential spreads from the kind of middle here to the downward, kind of the lower left, toward the apex, we similarly get an upward wave. Does everybody follow that? That's why we're getting upward waves, because the current is moving this way, this way, as it goes through the atria and then the ventricles. Let me try to show you something that I think is going to put this all together, I hope. Let's take a look at page 199. 199. Uh-huh. Well, let me get to this just so we can stay on the point that I'm trying to make. Now, this electrocardiogram on page 199 has an abnormality. This is not a normal sinus rhythm. <clears throat> it is lead to them. Now, as we look at this, if, as you start to look at it, many of us are going to kind of look right here and say, there it is, what the hell is that? There, that doesn't look right. You're right, but that's not the problem with the electrocardiogram. That's called a calibration pulse. Because like all machines, they have to be calibrated, and all they did was pass a five millivolt pulse, uh, and that's, uh, that appears on the electrocardiogram. That's not an, the abnormality. All right, so I'm gonna show you. Now, the order in which we should look at these waves is we should start with the most prominent, which is the R wave. 
So find some R waves and label them, right? Because we have QRS, QRS. OK, so we've got the R's. All right, that's usually the easiest way. All right? Now, I had said to you, after you find that QRS, the next wave after the QRS, call it the T wave. So find any QRS and find the next wave after it. That's the T wave. You can label it. That's the T wave. All right, you got the QRS and now the T. Now, the next wave after the T wave is the P wave. That's the order in which you look. So we've identified our QRS, we found our T, now let's find the P. Notice anything? It's inverted. It goes down when it should go up. Does everybody see that? There's an inverted P wave. There it is. Inverted P wave. It's opposite of normal. So we need to interpret this. Why? Basically what this means, now let's start with the QRS. The QRS and T wave look normal, right? QRS goes up like it's supposed to. T wave goes up like it's supposed to. The ventricles are depolarizing normally and repolarizing normally. So the ventricles we know, the uh, action potential is traveling normal through the ventricles. It's depolarizing and repolarizing normally. But the fact that the P wave is inverted means that the electrical current is going in the reverse direction of normal through the atrium. Does everybody follow that? Because we said it normally we get an upward wave as long as the action potential travels downwards. But we get an inverted wave if it's going in the reverse direction of normal. So the, ac the electrical current is actually flowing in the reverse direction through the atrium. Now, how can we explain the electrical current flowing normal, just as normal, through the ventricles, but going in the reverse direction of normal through the atrium? Unless the AV node is the pacemaker. What did I, what did I say? If the SA node stops working, who takes over as the pacemaker? The AV node. If the AV node is the source of these electrical signals, then it would still travel downwards just like normal. Whether it had, the signal had begun here or begins here, it travels down through the ventricles normally. But if it's originating here instead of the SA node here, it's going in the reverse direction of normal through the atrium. Because this is the source of the, pa this is the pacemaker. What is this called? This is known as an AV nodal or junctional rhythm. Not a normal sinus rhythm, but an AV nodal rhythm. The AV node is known as the junction between the atria and the ventricles, so sometimes they'll call it the junctional node. Does everybody see how that worked? Here's what's really fascinating about this. Again, here I drew this lead two. Remember, the lead two gives us a positive wave if the current's flowing in this way, but it would show an inverted wave if it were going in the opposite direction. So we have used the appearance of the waves on the electrocardiogram to interpret how this electrical current is flowing through the heart. Do you see how this works? Now, this is just the beginning, because this was just the introduction to lead two. And uh, obviously, there's uh, 11 more leads <laughs> to analyze here. But that's how they use the electrocardiogram to figure out where the problem is electrically. Remember, an electrocardiogram is only a description of electrical problems in the heart. Now, pro electrical problems lead to contractile problems because the action potential leads to contraction. So if, it doesn't, if the electrical current doesn't flow normally through the heart, the heart doesn't contract normally either. Uh, that's the problem with these arrhythmias. The electrical arrhythmias create uh, ar ar arrhythmic uh, uh, contractions as well. So you'll notice the way they described it, the impulses originating in the AV node with retrograde and antegrade transmission. And if you're wondering what does that mean, retro means backwards and antro means forward. So this, the current is flowing, flowing both retro backwards through the atria, but normally forward through the ventricles, just like normal. So that's how they describe it. Yeah? Is this because someone has a pacemaker? No, it's because the SA node has died. They had a heart attack in their SA node. 
And we wrote, and this was had an asterisk by it, as we pointed out a few minutes ago, on the bottom of page, whatever page it was, uh, thank you, if I could find mine. Uh, Yeah, it was 189, I think. Yeah, on the, let me just say this. On the uh, bottom of 189, we had written that if the SA node stops functioning, the AV node takes over as the pace anchor of the heart. Oh, so if the AV node stops functioning, then you need the pace anchor. Right. So don't confuse the two. Now, which one's considered more serious? An AV node will problem. The SA node, and incidentally, to go back to this, uh, page 199, uh, with, uh, when the AV node takes over, basically, they don't do anything. The rate of heart rate will be slower than normal, a little bit slower, because the AV node is a little bit slower than the SA node. But you'll notice that the, the, as long as the ventricles are working normally, and the ventricles are still depolarizing and repolarizing normally, we don't really care so much what the atria do. Because we learned last class meeting that the main function of the atria is simply to receive the blood flowing through the veins back to the heart while the ventricles are busy contracting and ejecting blood. So they, they, they're fine. They, it, any problems, in general, atrial arrhythmias, they don't do anything. Ventricular arrhythmias are serious. All right, and this is an atrial problem because as manifested by the fact that the P wave is not right. But the QRS and T are normal. So uh, the ventricles are still contracting and relaxing normally as indicated by normal depolarization and repolarization of the ventricles. Huh? Maybe this is going beyond the scope or I'm just not understanding, but then how, if, it's, if the electrical signals are only being conducted and started by the SA node or the AV node, how would they be going reverse? Because the aren't they, if the signals originate here, I mean, aren't all the cells electrically joined together? Yeah, no, I mean like, you said like the, heart, the, the worst problems are the ventricular problems going Yeah, through. when the ventricles, if the, if the action potential doesn't flow normally through the ventricles, that will affect how the ventricles contract, and that those are the ejection chambers. Right, how would that electrical signal started then from the ventricle, like the low, if it started like at the lower left, how would that get started that would go the other way? Well, remember, every cell in the heart is capable of generating its own action potential. So, uh, in fact, uh, when you have complete AB nodal block, action potentials start to be generated usually around the apex of the ventricle. Incidentally, this is kind of interesting, if the action potential, let's just say, let's say for just a moment, that the SA node and the AB node weren't working. There's this, right. So that, th they're still going to fire off an action potential in the heart, probably in the ventricles. If the action potential begins down here, it actually is going to spread in the reverse direction of normal. You know what that's going to create? A large, huge, inverted QRS wave. An inverted QRS, meaning the QRS going downwards, means that the current is flowing in the reverse direction of normal through the ventricles. And you will see that. Incidentally, you also see that with a pacemaker. Because with a pacemaker, they put the stimulator right here at the bottom, and the current flows in the reverse direction. Yeah. Because that's what they do. No, it still works, but you, see a, a, you can clearly see an inverted QRS wave. Okay, is the way they do it. So they don't actually put a, a battery-powered pacemaker where the AV node would be. No, they usually connect it to the ventricles. All right. Um, there is a question. Yep, question. Oh, yes, I'm sorry. So the P wave would be inverted too when you put the in, uh, where you put the pacemaker in the ventricle. Yes. Part, yes. But not the T wave, right? It could also be. Again, there's so many variations on this. Uh, let me just remind you there's nothing you need to know on page 195, but just looking at page 195. Uh, this shows you on lead two, which is the only one that I'm really making any attempt to explain, shows you the three basic waves, P, Q, R, S, and T. Notice all three are up, which means the current is flowing downwards, the way they're defined. 
But I'd like you to notice, this is what a normal lead three looks like. Now does lead three, a normal lead three, this is normal. Does that look anything like lead two that I've been describing? No. Now, so that's why I said, if you don't know which lead it is, and you mistook that this was lead two, you'd say, my gosh, what the hell's going on in this person's heart? Because that wouldn't be a normal lead two at all. But in fact, that was a totally normal lead three. And you can see each of these leads, the wave patterns look differently. Did we see that? So they each are interpreted on their own way. And if somebody has, as we explained last time, if they have an enlargement of the right ventricle, let's imagine they had a myocardial infarction on the back lower part of the ventricle. It says postro inferior. Postro means back, inferior means bottom. So on the lower bottom back side of the ventricle, if that's where the heart attack or infarction is. So look at how the wave patterns change. Here's lead two. Does everybody see that? Doesn't look normal at all. And, but look at, and you see changes in all these uh, electrocardiogram leads. So as I mentioned last time, I can't do this. I'm not a cardiologist. I just pretend to be somebody here in the class. But a cardiologist can look at any of these leads. You tell them which lead it is, they tell you exactly what the problem is. Because that's what, they're, that's what they're, they're trained to do. Now, I want to show you something uh, here. Yeah, on page 196, on 196, I just want to remind you, on 196 in the middle of the page, that we said an inverted T wave is commonly seen when you have a ventricular myocardial infarction. And I want you to see that. And again, this is all a very oversimplified presentation, but it's at least something more than, a lot more than what you knew before. Let's go take a look back on page 185. 185. And back on page 185, we were talking about what happens after a myocardial infarction. We had said that after a myocardial infarction where the heart muscle dies, uh, the uh, injured cells and dead cells leak out enzymes into the bloodstream, including CPK. And how high those CPK levels rise is an indication of the severity of the heart attack or myocardial infarction. We also said that there's changes in the electrocardiogram, that these are lead two. So here's a normal lead two, right? We should be able to start to recognize a normal lead two, not any of the other leads. P wave, upward P wave, upward QRS wave, upward T wave. And so that's totally normal. What I'd now like you to look at is figure D. This is actually pretty typical of a ventricular myocardial infarction. And you'll notice the P wave looks totally normal, doesn't it? So the, there's nothing wrong with the atrium. But there's clearly a problem in the ventricles. The QRS wave doesn't look normal, and the T wave actually is inverted. So we know just from the wave patterns, from what we've learned, the problem is in the ventricles. So it's a ventricular myocardial infarction. And uh, if you actually read the legend, it, it basically describes this. This is uh, showing exactly what happens. Uh, and there's all kinds of other changes that occur. Uh, you might ask, well, like how, if somebody did have a heart attack, like, so is this going to go back to normal? It will never look normal. Part of their heart muscle is dead. So the electrical current is never going to flow normally through their heart when you've got a chunk of dead meat in there because the current has to flow around the dead cells. Now, there are changes over time. And you can see uh, there, this is showing a series of that, an electrocardiogram in the same patient over time. But it will never look normal because uh, the part of the heart is dead. So uh, that's always going to appear uh, as an abnormality. Let me uh, mention a few other, uh, quote, arrhythmias. Uh, just before I do so, as I flip back and forth through the, my mixed up pages, you know, on page 197, on 197, there's nothing you need to know here. So as always, just before you tear it out and throw it away. <laughs> I love you. 
the way in which the electrical current, the way in which the electrical current flows through the heart is much more complicated than I have made it out to be. Because I have suggested that the electrical current is essentially flowing from the upper right at the SA node to the lower left. But remember, the heart is not a flat sheet of paper. It is three-dimensional. Right? It's three-dimensional. It's not a flat sheet of paper. So in fact, the electrical current is not only moving from an upward to a downward direction, it's also flowing from the inside of the heart outwards, towards the outside. So it's really, they actually analyze this in vectors, and they call it vector cardiography, where they measure the vector electrical current in the three dimensions. That's what cardiologists do, I know. And so this is showing you a little bit of a sense of this, that the electrical current generally is moving downwards through the atria, and then it actually flows, as the current is moving down these bundle branches, it's actually flowing from the left side of the septum towards the right. And then it flows, uh, then it flows uh, downwards through the ventricle and then flows from the inside wall of the ventricle outwards. So it's flowing three-dimensionally, this electrical current. That's why when we look at even the lead two, even the lead two electrocardiogram, that's why, even on the lead two, that's why we see these downward deflections, like the Q and the S, because it's changing direction at those points in time. So that's why, even though the major pattern is upward waves, we actually see downward waves at the Q and the S, because it's switching directions as the current flows. And again, if we look at these other leads, they give us better views of how the current is flowing from the inside out, or how it's flowing from the right to the left side, or left to the right side, uh, through the septum. So that's why they analyze all of these leads, as different views of three-dimensionally how that current is flowing. Uh, the exact type of electrical problem determines what the treatment is. And they have all kinds of different medications. They have uh, a pacemakers of the heart. And a newer method that has developed over the last 15 or 20 years is doing actually a surgery uh, where they literally will uh, destroy certain parts of the heart to change the current flow. And uh, this is done by spe specialized uh, cardiologists. I know of one where that's what they do is this special surgical procedures to try to e eliminate these arrhythmias uh, basically, if you've got damage here, they actually damage something else so that the current starts to flow more normally. And they analyze that whole current flow uh, you know, very, in a very complex way. Yeah, it's called a maze procedure. And okay. they put cut like crosshatch marks on particular parts of the heart to create scar tissue. Thank you. It would, what else do you know about that? Um, well, um, it, it varies the degree of scarification uh -huh. that they want. Uh, varies based on what's going on with the heart. But I know someone who just had it. Right. This is the newest thing so that pers a person doesn't have to necessarily take medication. They may not even have a medication that would work, but it also allows them in some cases so they don't have to take medication, which is a lot better because we know all medications have all these myriad of side effects. And if they can correct it surgically through these electrosurgical procedures, uh, that's what they're now doing. Right. And then they'll know if it was successful or not. Th thank you very much. You know, I, I, I know of somebody who does it, but again, it's way beyond me. I don't pretend to understand mm -hmm. it, but I know that what they're doing in general terms. Uh -huh. When someone has a battery card pacemaker, how yeah. does the battery work? It, it works like any other battery. It looks like, works just well, like my other batteries. How long do they last? They, uh, they, they last for about three to five years, and then they have to replace it. Uh -oh. Well, it's under the skin. It's not, uh, they stick the wire through between the ribs into the heart, but the battery is under the skin. It's not inside your chest cavity. So they don't, it doesn't require open heart surgery for a pacemaker. It's pretty, they're pretty common. There's a lot of older people who have pacemakers. Um, okay. Um, the, uh, let's show you uh, some other uh, problems. These are minor, but uh, on 198, 
So on 198, you remember that I said uh, if an electric cardiogram is totally normal, it's called an NSR, normal sinus rhythm. Now, this particular electrocardiogram on the top of 198 is labeled sinus bradycardia. So the problem here, the only problem, is that it's basically too slow. The, it's called sinus to indicate that the sinoatrial node or SA node is still acting as the pacemaker. It's just firing off slower than it should. As you look at these waves, they look totally normal. They look totally normal, but it is slower than it should be. I'll come back to that in just a moment. Now, right below it, it's labeled sinus tachycardia. Again, it's called sinus because the impulse is originating at the SA node. All the waves look totally normal. But I think all of you can see, comparing these two, this is much faster, isn't it? But all the wave patterns look normal. Now, obviously, what is normal as far as speed should be somewhere between this one and this one. It should, the electrocardiogram pattern should be faster than this and slower than this. That would obviously be what's normal. All right, so does everybody see the, the electrocardiograms now? Not only are we starting to just learn, uh, be able to look at these electrocardiograms a little bit and understand a little bit about what's going on, I'm going to show you how far you've come. If somebody had sinus tachycardia, what medication would you suggest they put, be put on? A beta blocker. Does that make sense? Not penicillin. Does, uh, a sympatholytic. Because can everybody see that if you block the sympathetic influence, the only influence on the heart would be the parasympathetic, which would tend to slow it down. That's exactly how they would treat it. They would give a beta blocker for a sinus tachycardia. Conversely, if somebody had a sinus bradycardia, what would you suggest? All right, now you could give, you could give in theory, a sympathomimetic to speed it up. But we know, like adrenaline, but we know they always prefer blockers over mimetics. So in all probability, they would use a parasympathetic blocker, a parasympatholytic. So the point that I think that we can kind of really pat ourselves on the back is that not only are we starting to look at these patterns and understand what's going on, we're actually taking the knowledge that we've learned and even being able to predict what kind of medication they might use to treat it. So this is really moving into medicine. See how this works? Because in the, that's why, incidentally, the nervous system was the most important preeminent system. Because we use a lot of the medications are mimicking or blocking the neural influence. So if you know how the nervous system speeds up or slows down something, we can always adjust speeding up or slowing down of any organ by mimicking or blocking a parasympathetic or sympathetic effect on that organ. So that's uh, starting to give you a kind of reveal the secrets, as it were, uh, of how this all works. And one last uh, thing here before I take a break. Um, <clears throat> uh, this uh, electrocardiogram is hard to make out. It was purposely uh, shown at a lower scale. Uh, so it's not the normal size electrocardiogram. It was. Uh, kind of, the, we're looking at a longer view of this electrocardiogram, so the amplitude is, is smaller than normal. But it was done for a specific reason. Um, it, you'll notice it says inspiration and expiration. What does that mean? It means breathing in and breathing out. Uh, another word for inspiration is inhalation. Another word for expiration is exhalation. Oh, 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 oh. oh yeah. Now, uh, what you'll notice, what I'd like you to notice is this. Every time the person's inhaling versus exhaling, how does that change the heart rate? Increases faster, slows down. It looks like when you inhale, can, does it look like it's faster, and when you exhale, it's slower? Mm -hmm. This is actually what happens in everybody. So even though this is called, it says sinus arrhythmia, Everybody has this arrhythmia. 
Because you remember how we're starting to learn how everything affects everything else in the body? Well, your breathing pattern affects what your heart does. And every time you inhale, your heart rate speeds up. 